Welcome to Geography 485 585L Internet Mapping, Module 4.1 Interoperability Standards, WMS, KML, and XML. This week we will be covering four topics, starting with a discussion of the extensible markup language, including a brief discussion of what exactly a mark markup language is what the requirements are in XML for uh, both validity and being well formed, and a discussion of extensibility of XML. We will then move on to KML, also previously known as Keyhole Markup Language, and discuss it in the context of its structure as an XML document and how it represents a combination of representation and spatial data in, a, in an XML document that can be used by virtual earth and two-dimensional mapping applications. We will then start our discussion of Open Geospatial Consortium Services with a uh, conversation about Web Map Services, or WMS, with an uh, overview of the requests and results of those requests uh, with a particular focus on the get capabilities, get map, and get feature info requests and their responses from a remote server. And finally, we will have a brief, uh, brief discussion of the integration of web map services into KML files as an alternative way to display information in a KML document. Starting with the extensible markup language, we have some background. Um, in this case, um, XML is one of a number of markup languages that have emerged out of the standard generalized markup language, which is an ISO standard. The two that we are working with in the context of this class include hypertext markup language, which you have been working with uh, from the very beginning as the way of defining your structured content for your web pages. And today we will be discussing XML, or Extensible Markup Language, which is the core means for structuring the uh, information provided by a wide variety of the Open Geospatial Consortium services that we will be working with for defining data representation models for GML and KML, and is also the, um, the parent standard for um, XHTML, um, which is essentially the XML variant of HTML uh, that you've been working with in, uh, over the course of the semester. XML 1.0 was released as a W3C recommendation in 1998 and is currently in its fifth edition. And while version 1.1 was released in 2004, it remains not in broad use and uh, the fifth edition remains the most broadly used standard. In the design of the XML standard, um, there were a number of goals that were um, defined a as a part of the design process, and these are listed here. Um, first, that it should be um, easily usable over the internet meaning that it should be easily exchanged over the networks that form the internet. The fact that it is based on um, uh, the uh, text, voca text structured text um, allows this in a very straightforward manner. As a general purpose uh, specification, XML was designed to be able to support a wide variety of applications. So it is not designed for any specific application, but instead is designed to be generally usable. It was also to be designed to be compatible with SGML, so that it complied with the, uh, the SGML standard, which would then allow for additional uh, transformation and repurposing of XML content into SGML applications and toolkits that, um, that apply that standard. It was designed so that it should be easy to write programs for processing XML documents. Um, 
Easy is a relative term. Um, parsing complex XML documents still can be challenging, but that is certainly one of the design goals of the standard itself. The one, another goal was to actually have a minimum or zero number of optional features in XML, basically to keep the documents in XML as standard as possible so that you're not having to try to take into account optional features that may be present in some XML documents and that aren't in other others. Another goal, and depending upon uh, you know your uh, your interests, this may or may not have been uh, uh, successfully achieved, is that XML documents should be human legible and reasonably clear. Um, this is while they are also structured documents that are easily parsed by computers, but they should also be readable by humans, where you can extract information useful usefully from them by just reading through the structured information. And we'll get some experience with that as we look at the XML capabilities document provided by the Open, Open Geospatial Consortium Web Map Services. There is also a, a desire to be able to enable um, rapid design using XML so that you basically do not have to um, go through a long intensive process to design a particular XML uh, definition and document. At the same time, the design of XML is, is by intention intended to be formal and concise meaning that it is formal that you, um, you essentially define what the structure of an XML document should be for a particular application and that you can define that specification uh, in a very compact syntax. Another goal was that XML documents should be easy to create. You can, you can use a standard text editor, there are specialized tools, you can generate them in any number of programming languages. So the bottom line is that in the design of the XML standard, um, the XML documents should be easy to create using whatever uh, tools you have at hand. And the last characteristic um, is one that relates to a point that I made during the last lecture in terms of terseness of the markup being of minimal importance. This relates to the readability of, of XML for humans, um, which itself brings in some verbosity, but it also um, uh, you know, reinforces the use of essentially text-based and structured text as the content model for most XML. This translates into um, larger documents as we talked about GML as, as being one uh, document type or specification that's based on XML that can produce very large documents that it takes considerable time to transfer over the network. XML is not the most compact way of representing information, but it is a broadly used and supported way to do so. When we talk about XML, one of the areas where we have to start is a discussion about the structure of FN, XML and the distinction between well-formed and valid XML. Where well-formed XML basically is a document that conforms to the structural definition of, of XML as a core standard. If a document is not well-formed, meaning that it does not conform to the XML standard, it is not XML. An additional step that is gone through for many XML documents is one of validation. So once it is determined that an XML document is well formed, you can then go on to the step of determining whether or not that document is valid when it is compared against a um, content structure that is defined typically in one of two different uh, ways. 
One is using a document type de definition or DTD, which was the original specification for defining the content of a given XML document. And these were typically defined in the context of particular applications that were using XML to represent data. Um, more recently, the concept of schemas um, ha has been developed. And there are a number of languages that have been developed for defining schemas, where schemas are a little bit more specific than DTDs in defining the structure and content of what would be considered a valid XML document. Any XML edit editing tools or any XML consuming applications that you work in should be checking for both well-formedness and validity as a part of the process of bringing in an XML document to either display or be edited. So this is something that happens in most cases behind the scenes in terms of this checking for well-formedness and validation. But it's something you should be aware of because you may um, periodically see uh, error messages being presented to you that relate to the results of those tests that are being performed by the systems you're working with that are consuming those XML documents. Here we have a simple XML document that we can use to now start talking about some of the content and structure of XML documents um, as an illustration of some of the elements that we'll be working with. So this is just an eight line um, XML document and we'll walk through the parts of that document uh, over the next few minutes. We start with the prologue, which as the name implies, is the content of the XML document that is outside of the core content of the document itself. This is essentially where um, much of the metadata about the XML document itself um, would, would be added. This is where you uh, actually put the XML um, uh, header at the top, the XML declaration. And in this case, this example also has a comment um, as a part of the prologue as well. Next, we have XML elements that at the highest level only do one thing, and that is define blocks of content, where those elements will most often come in pairs of a starting and ending tag, so that you can see here on line three, there's the beginning of the note element, and in line eight, the closing tag for that note, note element, as it's identified by the leading slash in front of the name. You should already, already be familiar with this pattern from the work that you have been doing with HTML, as HTML is defined based on many of the same principles, though HTML does allow um, a little bit more flexibility in terms of the, the pairing of tags or the closure of tags. So elements, again, are just generic blocks of content. But we can get a little bit more specific and talk about a specific element, the root element. The root element is special in that it is required Every XML document must have one. Every XML document must only have one. And it must be a pair of opening and closing tags. So in the, in the case of our example, our root element is the note element with the opening tag on line three and the closing tag on line eight. In contrast to the root element, we have content elements as well, which essentially contain all of the other document content. They occur between the opening and closing tags of the root element. And in the case of content elements, they may be paired opening and closing tags, or in some instances, they may actually be self-closing meaning that there is basically a single opening bracket, 
the name of the element, any other attributes, which we'll talk about in just a minute, and then a slash and the closing tag as a way to mark the end of a self-closing content element. So you may see these as you're looking at XML files as examples of those, those exceptions to the general pattern of having paired XML content elements. Elements may also contain attributes. So what attributes do is they define additional information about given elements. And they are included as a part of the opening tag for an element as essentially a name value pair where the name is equal to the value. So you can see in this example from line seven of our XML document, we have type equal instruction, where instruction is in quotes. That's one attribute that is that combination of the name equal value pair um, as, as the definition of that attribute. You can have as many attributes associated with an element as are needed to capture the information about that element. You also can, in some cases, have element content, where that element content may be other elements, or it may be text, as we see here. So we, can, we have, in this example, um, an illustration of element content, again from line seven of our sampled file, where the, the phrase, don't forget me this weekend, is the element content for the body element. So the way to think about dot element content is that it is basically anything that is contained within an element, which may be other XML elements or it may actually be essentially a text element because even this text string, when you're using programs to read the information is actually treated as a text element. It just doesn't show up as that uh, in the in the editors. Let's get back to this question of valid versus well formed. In this case, the document that we have been looking at is well formed, but not valid. Why is that? Um, as we look at this, we do not have any DTD or schema that is referenced in the prologue that would provide the mechanism for validating this XML document against any sort of specification. In the absence of a DTD or a schema, we can only verify that it is well formed or that basically that it conforms to the XML standard for, uh, well, for structural integrity. As you're looking through XML documents, you're going to encounter a number of other common constructs that you should be aware of. The first being a doc type declaration or document type declaration that is going to appear in the prologue of an XML file that is either going to refer to an external uh, DTD or style sheet um, or it's going to actually include the DTD or schema information directly in the document. Um, though the, common the more common model is the one that we've already been talking about in the context of designing your websites, is including those, uh, those specifications, either the DTDs or the schema documents, including them by reference, to external files that can be reused for multiple documents. Another pattern that you're likely to see in XML documents that you're looking at are C data sections. The, this is basically an element that you can create that allows you to encapsulate content that would otherwise be um, recognized and possibly attempted to be interpreted as XML markup. 
So this would be the case if, you, for example, you had HTML or other other um, uh, code that has uh, some of the similar structure to XML. That XML, if it was trying to read, trying to read it, would think that it should parse it and and do something with it. By enclosing enclosing it inside this C data element, you're able to basically tell XML the XML processors that this is uh, this this is basically a set of character string characters that should be ignored as XML, but sh instead should just be treated as sort of an opaque string of text. You will also likely encounter XML namespace declarations, where those are also going to typically be defined um, in your XML document. Um, often in the root element, though they are sometimes declared elsewhere, where you're going to declare a namespace that refers to some external resource, but you're going to create that namespace with a name. In this case, in lines two and three, we're creating two namespaces, one called H and one called F. What these namespaces allow us to do is to combine elements from two different um, conceptual models where they might have the same names and be able to treat them as independent entities. So in this case, our H namespace corresponds to the HTML4 namespace, where our F namespace defines uh, relates to some set of terms or elements that relate to furniture. In both cases, both of those both of those specifications actually have an element called table. But we can proceed that table element with the namespace and just separate them by a colon so you can see on line 5 the h colon table that's basically saying that we want to create an element that is called table, but it is a table rel relative to the H namespace. Just as the TR element within that is also from the H, H namespace, and the TDs within that within the TR is also within the H namespace. So this is a the namespace is a prefix that allows you to distinguish between terms that may be ambiguous in your structure. Likewise, we have the in line 11, we have another table element, but this time it's associated with the F or furniture namespace. So we have the same element name, but it's distinguished from the 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 HTML table by the assignment to the F namespace. And then we have all of those um, F elements contained within it. So you'll see this as a pattern in a lot of XML documents as they bring in multiple namespaces for terms that otherwise might overlap as they're combined into a single XML document. With that background in XML, let's now move on to the KML standard as a particular um, instance of a uh, schema that is, that is defined for geographic data and representation based on the XML standard. As background, KML was originally developed as the Keyhole Markup Language by Keyhole Incorporated as a part of their Earth Viewer. And when Google acquired Keyhole in 2004, they then started to integrate it as the core data model for exchanging data that was going to be displayed in the Google Earth product that was Google's version of Keyhole's Earth Viewer. Google um, eventually uh, brought the KML um, specification to the Open Geospatial Consortium where it went through the OGC standards process and in 2008 
KML version 2.2 became an OGC standard as opposed to merely a format that Google had defined and had uh, sole control of. If you look at the documentation provided by Google, um, you can see actually that Google does have some custom extensions beyond the OGC standard where they've actually created an additional namespace for defining those. Um, and those are fairly clearly identified in the Google documentation. That's where you might find in some KML documents a combination of essentially OGC standard KML and Google specific KML elements. It's just something you want to keep an eye out for. Either way, there are typically two file formats that you're going to receive KML files in. The first is as a KML file itself, a file that ends with the KML extension, where this is an XML document and it is directly readable and editable in any text editor as you could any XML file. Given the potential size of XML documents and KML documents, a second way of packaging KML files was developed called the KMZ file, where when you find a file that has the KMZ extension, that means that that is a file that has been compressed using the standard zip protocol or standard for compression. And many applications can read that KMZ file directly, but in some cases, if you want to edit a KML file you're, that's contained within a KMZ file, you're going to have to first decompress it using a decompression tool like, um, like uh, um, any, of the, any of the tools that that handle the zip format. And the other thing with KMZ files is that it will, it will contain at least a KML document, but it may contain other files as well that that KML file may make reference to. So it may have additional image files, other KML files in it. The KMZ uh, format allows for the packaging of multiple files into a single package. So that's something else that you may encounter. But the main thing to keep in mind is that if you get a file with a KMZ extension and you want to edit it or look at the, essentially the content of the KML file, you're going to have to first decompress that file to be able to get to the KML file that is inside. When we're talking about the capabilities of KML files, they actually are, are many. And this is one of the nice things about KML as a way to exchange um, data and some clues for representation uh, between systems. As they're commonly used to annotate the Earth, um, they're used in Google Earth and other uh, virtual Earth platforms for being able to um, display geographic information. Um, they allow you to specify icons and labels that can be associated with particular locations. They allow you to actually define camera positions and views for features that you define in KML, and those end up being named views and positions that you can then make use of in various applications that understand the KML standard. You can define a variety of image overlays that can either be attached to the ground, so essentially they're defined as uh, corresponding to a particular um, set of geographic coordinates, or you can attach them to the screen. So you could potentially add, say, a logo for your project to a KML file that would be displayed at a particular location in the screen of a viewer that is, that is displaying that KML, that KML file. You can define styles for individual features in a KML file that have an effect on their appearance. So this is where you can encapsulate 
both data that define the geometries of features and how they should be displayed into a single document. KML uses HTML to um, essentially write descriptions that can be attached to features. Much like the capabilities of the info boxes that you have started experimenting with in the Google Maps API, you can write those descriptions in HTML where you can even include hyperlinks and embedded images and any of those other things that you might use in defining documents using the hypertext markup language. KML allows you uh, to organize individual features into hierarchies. So you can essentially nest collections of features that may belong to particular categories into a hierarchical structure so you can enable or disable individual features or collections of features within that hierarchy. You can um, actually locate and update retrieved documents from either local or remote network locations. So you're not limited only to files that are located on your local hard drive, but KML files can actually um, retrieve remote resources, including uh, KML files, from remote servers as they're loaded and interacted with. KML also has, at its core, a three-dimensional um, texturing model where you can define the orientation and location of three-dimensional objects within the KML space. So you may provide either two or three-dimensional coordinates when defining uh, locations or features in KML. What can we generate in terms of KML content? KML provides a model, just as I was describing, for either encoding two or three-dimensional geometries that allows you to then view those geometries in either standard two-dimensional flat mappers or three-dimensional virtual globe applications. So you can take maximum advantage of applications that support a third dimension by creating three-dimensional geometries in KML files. KML uses latitude and longitude based upon the WGS84 datum for encoding horizontal position, where it uses then units in meters for representing altitude. Based upon, again, the WGS84 ellipsoid, and the EGM 96 geoid. So these are some spe specific definitions of altitude as it's relative to the Earth's surface and the shape of the Earth. So when you're defining your KML content, you need to make sure that you're doing it based on latitude, longitude, WGS 84 coordinates, and that you're expressing elevations in meters that are appropriate for this ellipsoid and geoid. Here is a simple sample of a two-dimensional uh, KML file on the left where essentially we have a, a, a complete KML file that you can actually download and view yourself from the lecture notes. But in this case, we're defining our root element, which is the KML. Within that, we then have a document element Within that, a place mark, and within that place mark, we're defining a polygon. And that polygon then contains several elements. One that defines the altitude mode, where in this case, the um, elements will be clamped to the ground surface so that if it was being displayed in a three-dimensional viewer, it would basically clamp the, uh, the x, y coordinates that are being provided to the ground surface. We're then defining the uh, polygon itself through this nested outer boundary is, then linear ring, then coordinates um, elements, where finally when we get to the coordinates, we are able to define the latitude, longitude, and I should actually say longitude, latitude values, and the elevation, in this case 300,000, um, 
for each of the um, five points that define this this uh, this uh, feature. So this is what the KML looks like. And if we look at the illustration on the right hand side, you can see what that looks like when it's projected into essentially a longitude latitude planar uh, map surface. Then you can see the same polygon when it is mapped to a, a spherical uh, coordinate system where the, essentially the, uh, the uh, XY coordinates are translated into coordinates on that spherical uh, representation. The number of content types that you can add to a KM KML file is fairly large. And I, and I encourage you to at least scan through the documentation for the KML standard and Google's documentation for the KML uh, standard just to get a flavor for the options that you have when you're creating KML files and representing information in them. The content, the high level content types that you can create include a wide variety of features, including place marks, folders and documents, and links to external resources through network links. As a part of that, you then can create a variety of geometries uh, consisting of points, line strings, polygons, three-dimensional models or, or defined locations that can either be in two or three dimensions. You can create a wide variety of overlays, whether they're um, photos or overlays in the screen, or onto the, into the geographic coordinate system for ground overlays. You can define a wide variety of styles that can be used repeatedly throughout your, um, your KML file. You can define links to external resources that, that relate to functions that you can execute related to those links. You can create a variety of views where you can define um, a particular camera and, and then define where that camera should look or essentially define a point of perspective for looking at features or viewing the content of your KML file. And KML also has basic support for time concepts where they basically have two um, mechanisms for defining time, either a time span where you can provide a start and end time for, that can be associated with a particular element in the KML file or a single point in time associated with a time stamp. If you, if you add time components to your KML file, some uh, clients actually will automatically display uh, controls that allow you to interact with the, with those time enabled elements so that they may actually be selectively displayed depending upon the conditions that are set in that time controller that they provide as a part of their user interface. Google Earth is a good example of this as their time slider uh, selectively enables or disables particular elements in a KML file based upon what that time slider, essentially the position of that time slider. Here we have links to some sample KML files that I encourage you to um, take a look at and experiment with. And I just wanted to um, display one of these uh, using Google Maps. One of the really interesting capabilities of Google Maps is that any KML file that is essentially accessible over the internet, so if you have, say, posted it on a web server or even posted it into GitHub, in um, a gh-pages location, you can point to that location from Google Maps using this Q equals and then the web address for that KML file to ask Google to load that KML file into Google Maps. So you can see here this red line, this red line that defines the boundary of the state of New Mexico, which is this KML file. This is really handy for being able to do quick previewing of some KML files. 
keeping in mind that Google Maps does have a limitation of three megabytes on the maximum KML size that it will display, either through this process or when you're accessing a, and integrating a KML file into a Google Maps application as a KML layer. Let's now move on to the Open Geospatial Consortium Web Map Services or WMS standard. As we've previously discussed, the WMS standard includes three request types. There is the WMS get capabilities, get map, and get feature info requests that can be submitted to a WMS service. In this case, let's look in a little bit more detail at the WMS get capabilities request. The capabilities request is key to gaining understanding of a particular WMS and the capabilities that it provides. If you cannot access the capabilities XML file and understand its content, you will not be able to formulate a coherent request to be submitted to a server for a map image or any other information. So the get capabilities request is the key for your understanding of a web map service. It is also key to any application that, that allows for communication with a web map service as the first step in configuring those applications is essentially to point it at the get capabilities request so they can retrieve the XML document that dis defines that service so that it can configure itself to effectively communicate with that service. Without the get capabilities request for any of these OGC services, we could not effectively communicate with any of them. So, that having been said, WMS um, has a variety of versions that have been developed through time. And depending upon the particular version of WMS that you're working in, a number of request parameters are either required or optional. So you can see in the first instance, the first two items under the request parameters, WMT VER equals 1.0.0 is required for a 1.0 version of WMS. For all later versions, the version equals version number is optional for those later, those later versions of the WMS standard. Service equals WMS is required for all versions of WMS, as here you are defining what the service type is that you're requesting. Because some servers actually implement more than one OGC service, you need to always remember to include service equals WMS when you're interacting with a WMS service. In version 1.0, you are required to include a request equals capabilities request type. From version 1.1 on, that request was changed to get capabilities. So you need to pay attention to what version of the standard you're working with because you need to change that request type from, get cap from capabilities to get capabilities if you're working with a WMS that is greater than 1.0. An optional uh, request parameter is an update sequence. This allows for um, actually having different update versions provided by a server where you can request those by name using the update sequence uh, request. Similarly, an optional parameter that only appeared in version 1.0 is the ability to provide vendor specific parameters, basic custom parameters that are specific only to a particular vendor's implementation of the WMS standard. Once we have successfully 
requested and have understand the content of the get capabilities request, we can then start working on developing a proper get map request. Where that get map request also has seen some change through time from the early version of 1.0 to the later versions. As an example, we have that same WMT version equal 1.0.0 for version 1.0, where you're required to provide a version equals and a version number as a part of the later version of the WMS standard. For the request type, for version 1.0, the request equals map. For all later versions, it is request equals get map. So you want to pay attention to that. In all versions of the WMS standard, you're required to provide a layers parameter, which defines a list of one or more comma separated layer names, where the layer names are defined in the get capabilities request. Styles are um, another required parameter for all versions, though in some instances you can leave it blank in terms of styles equals blank. Um, but the styles equal is required in all cases. Um, the styles will be provided in terms of the names of available styles as a part of the XML get capabilities response. The next set of required parameters relate to the spatial reference system or coordinate reference system that relate to the request being submitted. These must be in a spatial reference system that is supported by the web map service as advertised as a part of the capabilities response. In this case, if you're working in WMS version 1.0 through 1.1.1, the required parameter name is SRS, and then the namespace and the identifier. In many cases, that would be, for example, EPSG colon 4326, for example. With version 1.3.0 of the WMS standard, SRS was replaced with CRS for coordinate reference system. So make sure, again, that you know what version you're using up above and that you're supplying the correct either SRS or CRS parameter name where you're defining then the spatial reference system for your request. That relates directly to the next required parameter, which is the bounding box, where the bounding box corners are specified as a comma-separated comma list of the minimum x, minimum y, maximum x, maximum y bounding box for the map image that should be returned. That is required for all versions of WMS where those coordinates must be provided in the units of the coordinate reference system or spatial reference system specified as a part of the request. You also, since you're requesting a map image, are required to specify the dimensions of the map image that should be returned. So the next required parameter is the width parameter where you're specifying the width of the map image to be returned in, the, in, in pixels. So if you want a map image that is 200 pixels wide, you say width equals 200. To go with that width, you have to also specify a height. This is also in pixels, and this is the height of the map image that should be returned. A very important consideration that you need to keep in mind is that the WMS server does not take into account any discrepancies between the dimensions of the bounding box. Say you, re you request a rectangular bounding box, 
but you request a square image by specifying the same height and width, you're going to get a map image back, but that map image is going to be um, geometrically incorrect in that it's going to likely be smashed in either width or height depending upon what the aspect ratio of the bounding box in the, in the, map, in the map coordinates is. We're going to go through an exercise where you'll get some practice in calculating the, the, making, uh, the proper aspect ratio and adjusting the height and width of a WMS request so that you can avoid that, uh, that, uh, that warping of your map image based on a lack of alignment between the shape of the bounding box that is requested and the shape of the map image that is requested. Finally, the last required parameter is the format, which is the format that you would like the map image to be returned in. And this has been constant through all versions of WMS. You can only request a format that has been specified as a part of the get capabilities request or a response. So this is another case where you have to understand the content of the XML document that is returned as a part of the XML response to know what valid values you can put into this format parameter. After these, you then have another set of optional parameters that you can also provide including transparency that you can set to true or false so that depending upon the image format that you choose, you may be able to ask that the background color as defined by the map service be rendered as transparent. This is very useful for layering multiple WMS requests on top of each other, but you need to make sure that you request an image format that supports transparency where that, those formats are typically PNG or GIF, G-I-F, where JPEG does not support transparency. So regardless of whether or not you, you say true for transparency, if you, were a true, if you receive a J, or request a JPEG, the background pixels will not be transparent because that format does not support transparency. Another optional parameter is one where you can specify the background color using a, a hexadecimal red, green, blue uh, color value. So you can define what, what the background color should be. You can specify any optional exception formats where the default is XML, but if the server supports other formats, you can request those formats instead of the default XML. You can specify a time element. So if the, um, the web map service advertises support for time for versions 1.1 and above, you can supply a time parameter that allows you to extract or request a particular temporal subset of data that are available for, for a particular layer or layers. You can also, for data sets that have an elevation component, you can request a specific elevation for that layer to be delivered. You could think of this in terms of, say, an atmospheric data set that consists of raster data at multiple elevations in, in the atmosphere. Um, there may be other dimensions that are advertised as a part of the gate capabilities response where you can include those other dimensions in your request. And then for get map request, the vendor specific parameters have carried through as optional uh, parameters that can be provided as a part of the WMS request, get map request, that will be defined as a part of the get capabilities response. Finally, we have the get feature info request that allows you to do sort of a quick and dirty um, interrogation for data values that correspond to a particular XY coordinate in a map image. 
So you end up needing to do a little bit of a calculation to formulate a valid get feature info request, but it can be a way to um, retrieve information from a web map service that otherwise would be difficult to obtain. Say, for example, if they don't support the web feature service for requesting specific features and their associated attributes. As with the previous requests, the version requ uh, components changed from version 1.0 to versions 1.1 and beyond, where you have the WMT VR, VER for 1.0 and version equals for the other versions. You also had a change in the request type from version 1.0 to the later versions, where it changed from feature info for the 1.0 request to get feature info for the later requests. There is also a required partial copy of essentially a get map request that would generate a map image that is used by the WMS server to essentially translate the query coordinates into a location in the map image. So this is the this is the area where you need to already have an idea of what the get map request is and what the image is going to be um, before you then submit the rest of of the uh, of the uh, the request. You need to specify the query layers in terms of a comma separated list of one or more layers that should be queried. And then um, for earlier versions, you pretty much got the format that was defined by the server, um, where in version 1.3, you actually can um, specify uh, and are required to specify the uh, output format for the, um, the values to be returned. And then finally, you can um, request the, uh, a, a different number of features about which information will be returned as an optional value. So this is the feature count element. Continuing, we then get to the X and, and then in the later versions that was replaced with the I for the pixel column. So this is essentially a, the column within the map image defined by the WMS request that, that we talked about on the previous page. This is the column of that map image that should be used to extract, to define the location where the feature value should be extracted. For versions 1.0 through 1.1.1, the parameter is called X, and then you specify the column within that image. So if you have a map image that is only 200 pixels wide, that pixel column would be somewhere between 1 and 200. In version 1.3.0, X is replaced with I. Similarly, you also need to specify the pixel row, the row in the image that will be used to define the, uh, the location for the feature information extraction. For versions 1.0 through 1.1.1, that is Y. For version 1.3.0, that was changed to J as the specification of the pixel row. You have the option in the later versions of WMS to request an exception format. And until the most recent version, you could optionally provide vendor specific parameters as they are supported and advertised by the particular service through the get capabilities request. So here is a sample WMS request above and then the sample output down below. If we click on the link here, we can see here the display of the returned XML document in my browser Depending on your browser and its settings, it may instead display some unformatted text 
that you would need to save to your local hard drive to view in a text editor to be able to make effective sense of it. But in the Chrome browser, as I'm using here, you're able to actually see the structured content of the XML file that is returned as a part of the, X, the uh, get capabilities response. We can see first the root of our XML document is this WMS MS capabilities telling us what version it is. And this document then includes several sections including a service section, capability section, and then within that capability section, information about the supported requests and exceptions, and information about the layers. And I'm going to step through these one at a time to highlight some of the information that you can look for in this capabilities document to inform your knowledge of the service that you've submitted the request to. Starting with the service element and its content. We can first see that the name of this WMS service is OGC colon WMS. Other services might have more creative names, but this is in some respects a standard name that is often applied by default to map server generated web map services. We now have a title, which is supposed to be a more human readable but short title that might be used in a user interface to uh, reference the service as a whole. And then an abstract that describes the service as a whole. Again, any of the elements that are here in the service block um, relate to the entire service and not as much to the subcomponents of the service. We can see that there are several keywords that have been assigned to this to facilitate searching. And the online resource element is basically the, um, the resource that you want to look for to be able to figure out what the, how to start building the requests against this service. And in particular, you want to look for this hlink href element and the content of it here that is the root of the request that you would start to build that you would add the various request parameters onto to interact with this service. So when you're trying to figure out where, this, where you need to communicate with the service, this is the beginning of that connection information. It's essentially the host and route on that host out on the internet that's going to get to the point where you need to start adding your parameters for your request. We then have a bunch of contact information that includes information about the, the person who's the primary contact person, their address, and any other telephone numbers, email addresses, or other items that would be necessary to actually speak to a human being associated with the service. We can see here that there are no fees associated with using this service and that there are no access constraints associated with this service. But this is where information like that would be provided about the service so that you could see uh, what, what you might need to contend with in terms of meeting uh, fee requirements or access constraint requirements. When we move into the capabilities section, that includes several areas, including first the area where you have a number of the different requests that can be submitted to the service. Starting here with the get capabilities request, you can see that each request has essentially an, a, an element named after the request that can be submitted. And each of those elements that contain, then contains some core information that you need. First and foremost, the formats that are supported by that particular request. 
The thing to keep in mind is that each request has its own set of formats. Um, this has caused some area, some confusion in the past. So you want to make sure that you're looking at the right request when you're trying to identify which formats are supported by that request. So in this case, the get capabilities request basically just supports this one format, this application slash VND OGC dot WMS XML. We then have this next section where there's information about the different types of requests that can be submitted, including in this case both get and post. And again, this key online resource with this href xlink that has the beginning of the the essentially the request that you would start to compose to do a get capabilities request to which you would add the various request parameters. Here we have the get map request and the typically longer list of formats that are supported by the get map request. Information about the different request types that are accepted. Again, that link for the um, online resource. On some occasions, these will vary from request type to request type. So it doesn't hurt actually to look to make sure that it hasn't changed any as you go from, say, the get capabilities to get map request. And then get feature info as well. And then the two formats supported by that, the request types, including the online resource. And then in the particular case of this service, it does actually support some additional optional request types, including describe layer, get legend graphic, and get styles. As these are optional requests, um, I did not cover them in the lecture, but you can read about them in the documentation associated with the WMS standard. Information about exceptions and the some supported formats for exceptions is provided here. So you can optionally request a specific format for an exception other than the default XML. You may also have some additional parameters here and elements that might define any vendor specific capabilities and support for symbolization that's defined by users. These are more advanced models where clients can actually supply information about symbolization to a service and that service might modify the map images that are returned to reflect those uh, requested styles. Um, we're not going to really cover that in this class, but again, it's covered in the documentation. Finally, we get to the definition of the layers, where you're going to have at least one layer defined in each service, and in many instances, you're going to have layers that are nested within each other, where those layers inherit some of their values from the layers that contain them. So at the highest level, we have a layer defined here with a name of Argus dataset and a title of Argus dataset and an, and an identifier for that dataset and an abstract. We have a set of keywords and then a list of spatial reference systems that are supported by this layer. This becomes important because this is the master list of spatial reference systems that other layers that are contained within this one also support. So this is the beginning of the list that essentially child layers support in terms of requests that can be submitted to them. And you'll notice that they're specified using the EPSG um, naming convention, EPSG colon and then the EPSG numeric code. 
We also have at least the latitude longitude bounding box and in many cases you have a secondary or multiple secondary bounding box specifications that are provided in any number of the spatial reference systems that are supported by the system. This is a way where you can provide essentially pre-calculated bounding boxes for the for coordinate reference systems beyond the WGS84 um, latitude longitude boxes that are required for every layer. So this is the master containing layer and we can see here that we now have a layer contained within it that is being created. And it has a number of attributes associated with it. The first being whether or not it is queryable. This defines whether or not or, or informs you whether or not it will accept a get feature info request and whether it will return a result of that from that get, get feature info request. In this case, since queryable is set to zero, it is not queryable. This opaque attribute is defining and providing a queue to clients that would request this layer as to whether or not this layer is opaque or transparent or can be opaque or transparent. In this case, opaque equals zero means that it can be rendered transparently, which is, again, very useful if you want to overlay it on top of other uh, background data sets. This third attribute, uh, cascaded, indicates whether or not the source data for this layer are basically hosted by the server itself or whether they're actually being pulled from a remote server and then processed for delivery as a part of your WMS request. Um, cascading web services are available from some systems and if they are cascaded they should be announced as one of the attributes in the layers that are that are cascaded. This layer has its own name, its own title, and its own abstract. It has, in this case, an empty keyword list and its own spatial reference system, which would be in addition to the spatial reference system supported by the containing layer. This is something to keep in mind is that this contained layer inherits the spatial reference systems from the layer that contains it. So while 4326 is explicitly added here, it's also up above in the master list. It has its own bounding box information. So if this layer had a different bounding box, then the containing layer, that could be represented here. And something we haven't seen before, this layer also includes information about available metadata or documentation about the data underlying this layer. So in this case, you could again look at this href um, link. And in this case, this is a link to an online metadata document that you might want to look at if you wanted to learn more about the data underlying this particular layer in the service. Following this, we basically then have the closing tags for the various uh, elements going all the way back to the root element, this WMS MS capabilities. Here are some sample WMS requests, which in both cases are essentially the same, except for the differences in the width and height of the map images and the map formats. Otherwise, they're requesting the same data from the same service, and this is just a visualization of what those different responses look like. In this case, this is a version 1.1 WMS request. It's a get map request with a bounding box and geographic coordinates. We're requesting 
this particular layer in a map image that is 200 by 200 pixels in size where the bounding box is specified in EPSG 4326 coordinates and we're requesting the map image as a JPEG. You might remember from earlier I mentioned that JPEGs do not support transparency. So in this case, um, even if I didn't specify the uh, transparency uh, option, the, the server itself can automatically provide transparency on their behalf as a default. Um, but in this case, since we requested a JPEG, it doesn't matter because we're going to get an opaque image. That is in contrast to the second request where it is the same except we requested a larger map image, in this case 300 by 300 pixels. We specified transparent equals to true, leaving any ambiguity um, behind. And we specifically requested a format that supports transparency. And you can actually see the background, in this case of the slide, behind the map image um, where that transparency is taking effect. And essentially we're seeing through the areas of the image that contain the background or no data. Finally, we can look at bringing these two concepts together between the web map services and KML, where KML's ground overlay element allows you to essentially include a network accessible map image. And that map image may in turn be generated by a web map service. And the KML standard has gone one step further where it has included a model for parameterization basically the, the, the ability to set values that can be plugged into a request for a map image that for WMS requests can use to define, for example, the bounding box for a request from a client, say Google Earth. So as you zoom and pan around inside a client viewing a KML that is using a WMS ground overlay, each time you finish moving, that, that client can generate a new bounding box and add it to the rest of the information that has been defined in the KML file as a part of essentially the root of a get map request so that a new WMS map image can be integrated into the client interface. This is a very interesting model for being able to, in some cases, even replace the base map imagery that Google has provided for Google Earth with your own imagery. And through the use of the time parameters, the time span or time stamp parameters in KML, you can do basic time uh, enabled retrieval of WMS through hard coding the time element into your WMS requests. Um, there's not a good parameterization for mapping the client time, say the client is using the slider to view data that only correspond to a particular time. There's not a good model for actually having that automatically used to generate a time-enabled WMS request, but you can put multiple ground overlay elements into a KML file where each one of them corresponds with a particular time enabled WMS request and then the, the, then the time slider um, can correspond with the KML time elements to define for any viewer like Google Earth that it should turn those layers off and on based on the time that's encoded in the KML file. This is an example of a KML file that includes a WMS request where you can basically see here that we are creating a ground overlay element starting in row 4 and going to row 19 
We've given it a name of, in this case, the Argus Counties WMS. And we're defining an icon, where that icon is essentially our image. And we're defining it by providing, essentially, a WMS request, where we are adding into that request some special characters, these, these um, ampersand, amp, semicolon, separators, because if you were to add actual ampersands as you would in a request that you're building, um, say, uh, to interact directly with a web map service, since we're working in XML here, those ampersands would actually be interpreted as XML. By using these text strings, we're inserting ampersands into that WMS request in a way that X, the XML interpreters will not get confused. So that's what, that's what all of those are. And you can see that we're specifying basically a full WMS request, understanding that this bounding box in any given Earth viewer is likely to be replaced by the viewer as it refreshes the map as the user interacts with the map interface. We're also defining the bounding box for this um, ground overlay so that a client knows essentially the region that that overlay covers. And this is the entire specification of a WMS um, integration into a, uh, a, a KML file that you could open up in something like Google Maps.